imagine this for a second. Our hunt for energy, you know, the stuff that powers our lives, it's not just changing the air. It's actually uh, shaking the ground under us, like literally causing tremors, earthquakes. Tied directly to what we're doing, welcome to the Deep Dive. Today, we are going deep into how our, well, our reliance on fossil fuels is messing with the planet in ways you might not expect. We're talking human-caused earthquakes, yeah, but also things like water contamination. And then we'll pull back, sort of connect these specific things to the bigger picture of environmental science, you know, how we even study all this. Right. And for this journey, uh, our guide is environmental science, a world in balance. Specifically, we're drawing from chapter one, which was prepared by instructor Mr. Hassan. It's a really solid foundation, gives us those case studies, but also the, uh, the framework, the big ideas that tie it all together. Yeah, exactly. And our aim for you today is to get past the noise, the headlines. We want to give you a really clear handle on these connections, those aha moments, you know. But without drowning you in data, you'll get what's happening, sure, but also why it matters for all of us, for our shared world. Okay, let's dive in. So first things first, the reality check. Fossil fuels, we're talking coal, oil, natural gas, stuff formed like ages ago from organic matter. They still provide something like 80% of the world's energy. 80%. It's huge. It really is. And that massive dependency is still there, even though we're, well, increasingly aware of the environmental costs, aren't we? Definitely. It flags up this huge challenge we face in shifting towards uh, more sustainable sources. And a key technique in getting at some of these fuels, especially oil and natural gas trapped deep down, is hydraulic fracturing. You've probably heard it called fracking. So uh, basically how it works is they inject this high-pressure mix, mostly water, but also sand and some chemicals way down into shale rock. The pressure cracks the rock, fractures it, see? And that lets the gas or oil flow out. And the scale is just enormous. We're often talking millions of gallons of water for just one of these walls. It's a massive industrial operation happening deep underground. Millions of gallons. Of yeah. But here's where it gets, well, really interesting and maybe a bit concerning. What happens after? That fluid they used, it's now contaminated with whatever chemicals they put in, plus stuff from down in the rock itself. And it doesn't just disappear. Very often it gets pumped back down, even deeper usually, into what they call disposal wells. Okay, so they're just getting rid of it deep underground. Exactly. And that process, the wastewater injection, that's the crucial bit. That's the direct link to what scientists call induced seismicity. Induced seismicity, meaning earthquakes caused by people. Precisely. Human-triggered earthquakes. It's a direct result of these energy extraction practices. And there's actual proof of this. It's not just theory. Oh, absolutely. The U.S. Geological Survey, the USGS, they've shown a really strong correlation. They've directly linked these deep injection wells to uh, a huge increase in earthquakes in places that almost never had them before. Like where? Oklahoma is the classic example. It went from having maybe one or two small quakes a year to... Hundreds, clusters of them. Hundreds. Wow. So it's not subtle then? Not at all. It's a really clear signal that what we do on the surface or just below it can have profound effects much, much deeper down, literally changing the geology. Okay, so induced earthquakes, that's one major thing. Yeah. But you mentioned water contamination too. Yes. That's another big area of concern. Tremors are one thing, but risks to water, that's fundamental. How does that happen? Is it the fracking fluid itself getting into drinking water? It can be. Think about the well itself, the pipe going down. If the casing, the lining of that well isn't perfect, if it fails, or if there are spills up top during handling, right. leaks, pathways open up. And the stuff used in fracking fluid or methane gas released from the rock can potentially migrate into groundwater aquifers. Aquifers meaning the underground water sources we drink from. Exactly. The sources communities rely on. And that contamination... It's serious. It can be very serious. We're potentially talking about methane, which isn't acutely toxic, but can pose explosion risks and displace oxygen, and also various chemicals used in the fluid itself, some of which are known hazards. If that gets into drinking water, it's obviously a major health risk. Plus, it can damage ecosystems that rely on that groundwater. So it forces a tough question, doesn't it? How do we balance needing energy with protecting something as basic as clean water? That's the crux of it. It really highlights the difficult trade-offs involved. And the environmental footprint, it doesn't stop at earthquakes and water, does it? No, unfortunately not. There's the climate angle, too. Methane, again. Right. Natural gas is mostly methane. It is. And during the extraction and transport process, some of it inevitably leaks into the atmosphere. It's called fugitive emissions. 
And methane is a greenhouse gas, like carbon dioxide. It is, but it's much, much more potent in the short term. Over, say, 20 years, a molecule of methane traps way more heat than a molecule of CO2. So even if it breaks down faster eventually, its immediate warming impact is much stronger. Exactly. That's a significant factor in near-term climate change. And then there's just the... Um, the local impact, the area around the drilling sites. Yeah, absolutely. The whole operation creates a lot of local ecological stress. You've got land being cleared for the well pads and access roads, which fragments habitats. You've got a huge increase in heavy truck traffic, bringing in water and equipment, taking away waste fluid, that means noise, dust, road wear. And the chemicals themselves being stored and used on site. Right, all of that adds up. It puts pressure on local plants, animals, soil, air quality, the whole local environment feels it. Given all these impacts, the quakes, the water risks, the leaks, the local disruption, it's hardly surprising there's a big debate about how to manage it, how to regulate it. Oh, definitely. It's a very intense debate. A key question is about oversight. Should it be primarily state-level regulation, or does the federal government need a stronger role? And different places are handling it differently. Very differently. We've seen some states respond quite strongly. Faced with evidence of environmental damage or health concerns, some have put temporary halts, moratoriums on fracking. Others have gone further and banned it completely within their borders. So real policy consequences driven by these concerns. Yes. And it's important for us to state, you know, we're just outlining these debates and actions here. We're reporting on the different approaches being taken, not endorsing any particular one. Understood. OK, so we've looked quite closely at the impacts of energy extraction. Let's maybe zoom out now. When environmental scientists talk about the environment, what are they actually including? Is it just like forests and oceans or is it broader? That's a great question because, yeah, it's much broader than just wild nature. Really, the environment is the sum total of everything around an organism that interacts with it, living things, non-living things. Everything. So like a city counts as part of the environment. Absolutely. It includes natural systems, yes, forests, oceans, deserts, but also human-built systems, cities, farms, roads, and even invisible forces, things like climate, uh, air pressure, radiation levels. It's all interconnected. It's the whole context. Okay. So it's this incredibly complex, all-encompassing thing, which must make studying it, environmental science, pretty challenging. It is challenging, but that's also what makes it so fascinating and so crucial. Environmental science is fundamentally interdisciplinary. It's not just one subject. Meaning it pulls from lots of different fields. Exactly. It has to. It aims to understand how the natural world works, how we affect it, that's key, and also how it in turn affects us. It's a two-way street. So what kind of fields does it draw on? Oh, loads. Biology, ecology, definitely. Right. Chemistry, geology, atmospheric science, oceanography, but also social sciences. Economics, sociology, political science, ethics, because human behavior and decisions are central to environmental issues. Right. You can't really separate the science from the human element. You really can't. It tries to weave all these perspectives together to get a holistic view. You need chemists to understand pollution, geologists for earthquakes, ecologists for ecosystems, sociologists for human responses. You mentioned ecosystems there. That seems like a core concept. Our source called them nature's living tapestries. Can you unpack that a bit? Yeah, it's a good analogy. An ecosystem is basically a community of interacting organisms. That's the biotic part, the living things, plants, animals, microbes, mm -hmm. interacting with their non-living or abiotic environment, things like sunlight, temperature, water, soil, minerals, the air. So it's the living and non-living stuff interacting in a specific place. Precisely. Think of a coral reef. You have the corals themselves, the fish, the algae, the sharks, that's the living community. But they're all interacting with the water temperature, the salinity, the sunlight filtering down, the physical structure of the reef. Cool. Or like a forest or even just a pond. Exactly. A rainforest, a desert, a single pond in your backyard. They're all ecosystems. And the key thing is the interactions, the feedback loops. Plants use sunlight and soil nutrients. Herbivores eat plants. Carnivores eat herbivores. Decomposers break down dead stuff, returning nutrients to the soil. It's this intricate web. It sounds like understanding those interactions is vital. It is, because if you change one part, introduce a pollutant, raise the temperature, remove a key species, it can have cascading effects throughout the whole system. That balance is often more delicate than we realize. You mentioned earlier environmental science is interdisciplinary, focused on understanding. How does that differ from, say, environmentalism? 
Yeah. People often use the terms interchangeably. That's a really important distinction to make. They are related but distinct. Environmentalism is primarily a social movement. It's driven by ethics and values. Its goal is to protect the natural world, advocate for conservation, push for policies to reduce human impact. So it's about action, about changing things. Yes, it's advocacy focused. Think of famous environmentalist Rachel Carson, whose book Silent Spring sparked huge changes, Greta Thunberg today, mobilizing youth, Wangari Maasai, and the Green Belt Movement in Kenya. They're driving change based on a conviction that we need to protect the environment. Okay, and environmental science. Environmental science provides the objective information, the data, the understanding of how these systems work and how we're impacting them. It's evidence-driven. Ideally, environmentalism uses the findings of environmental science to inform its goals and arguments, but the science itself strives for objectivity, for understanding, regardless of the policy outcomes. One is values-led advocacy, the other is evidence-led inquiry. Got it. Science provides the what and how Environmentalism focuses more on the what should we do about it. That's a good way to put it. Though many scientists are also passionate advocates, the discipline itself is about the understanding. Okay. So bringing this back to us humans, our source material describes our relationship with nature as a kind of disrupted dance. What does that mean? It means our activities aren't just minor tweaks to natural systems. We are fundamentally altering them on a massive global scale. We've changed the steps of the dance, so to speak. In what ways? Can you give some examples? Well, think about land use. Deforestation, cutting down vast forests for farming or cities, that completely changes the landscape, affects water cycles, biodiversity. Urbanization, too, paving over land. Exactly. Agriculture itself, especially industrial agriculture, transforms ecosystems. Then there's our fossil fuel use, which we talked about. It's changing the composition of the atmosphere, driving climate change at an unprecedented rate. And pollution. Pollution is huge. Chemicals in our water, plastics in the ocean, smog in our air, contaminants in the soil. And just the sheer scale of resource extraction, mining, drilling, fishing, logging, we're often taking resources out faster than natural systems can replenish them. We're straining those natural cycles. Though it's a lot. We're really reshaping things. We really are. Yeah. Which leads to this profound idea from the source text. Yeah, I was struck by this phrase. We are both part of and apart from nature shaping and being shaped by it. Hmm. It captures our unique position perfectly, doesn't it? How so? Well... We are part of nature. We're biological organisms, totally dependent on Earth's systems for air, water, food, everything. We evolved within these systems. We're also a part. Yes. We have this consciousness, this technology, this ability to analyze, plan, and intentionally manipulate natural systems on a scale no other species can. We can step outside the immediate flow, in a sense, and decide to reshape it. So we're embedded within it, but also have this unique power over it. Precisely. Shaping it, and in turn, being shaped by the consequences of those changes, like climate change impacting our societies or pollution affecting our health. It's that constant interplay. Okay. So as we wrap up this deep dive, we've covered quite a bit of ground. We have. We started with some really direct, tangible impacts of our energy choices, those induced earthquakes, the risks to water quality from fracking and wastewater disposal, very concrete examples. And then we broadened out, looked at the field of environmental science itself, how it's this interdisciplinary effort to understand the whole intricate web from ecosystems to global climate. Absolutely. We saw how something specific like wastewater injection isn't isolated has ripple effects connecting geology to water resources, impacting communities. And environmental science gives us the tools, the framework to actually see those connections, mm. to analyze them, right? Not just react to them. Exactly. It helps us understand the why behind the what, which brings us back to that final thought, perhaps, this dual role we have, being in nature, utterly dependent, yet also having this incredible power to stand somewhat apart and consciously reshape it. Yeah. That idea of being both part of and apart from what responsibility does that give us? If we understand our embeddedness and our unique capacity to alter the systems that sustain us, how should that guide our actions? How do we navigate that? How do we consciously try to balance our very real needs for energy, for resources, with the essential health and stability of the planet's systems? Yeah. The systems that ultimately support all life, including our own. Yeah. That's a big question to carry forward. It is. It's not one with easy answers, but it's probably the fundamental question environmental science pushes us towards, something we're thinking about constantly.